room and we will get started momentarily. Morning and welcome to WIDA's webinar. We are just giving everyone a moment to get into the Zoom room and we will get started momentarily. Good morning and welcome to WIDA. We are delighted you could join us for today's programs. Before we get started, we have an important announcement to make. The date for our event to discuss CPTPP accession efforts by China, Taiwan, and the UK has been changed. It's now gonna be held Wednesday, November 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We made this change to accommodate the schedule of Tim Grosser, New Zealand's former Minister of Trade and Ambassador to the United States and the WTO. Tim will be coming to us from Wellington for the online event. Information can be found on that and our other events at www.wita.org. Also, if you are a WIDA sponsor, and if you haven't returned your guest forms for our October 20th annual dinner, please do so by tomorrow at the latest. This year, we are honoring the chairman and ranking members of the House Ways and Means Committee, Richard Neal and Kevin Brady, and Ambassador Susan Schwab, the former United States Trade Representative, will be our MC for this fully vaccinated live and in-person event. As you know, if you've attended some WIDA webinars in the past, you know that we like to call out the names of some of those you're in community with, even if you can't see them on Zoom. So welcome today to Susan Thornton at the Yale Law School, Mark Mowry at USTR, Luis Renta at the US Conference of Mayors, and Linda Forster at the Pennsylvania Office of International Business Development. Welcome Susan, Mark, Luis, and Linda, and welcome to all of you. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can ask questions of our panelists using the Q&A tab on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of those as we can towards the end of our session. You should have also received a copy of today's event program by email, so we can dispense with lengthy introductions. We're very pleased to welcome today's panel who should be familiar to the Washington DC trade community. My good friend, Bruce Stokes, who I've known for almost 30 years since I was a young Hill staffer in the 1990s and uh, worked with Bruce on a congressional staff foreign policy roundtable series when he was with the Council on Foreign Relations. Kira Alvarez, who many of you know from her time as the chief negotiator for IP enforcement in the Obama administration and is now vice president for government relations at Viacom CBS. Peter Algeyer, the former US trade, uh, deputy US trade representative and ambassador to the, US t uh, to the WTO, who's been a frequent guest at WIDA and a past honoree at WIDA's annual dinner and a past MC at the event. And of course, Kathy Novelli, who served as a senior official at USTR and the State Department and is now the president of Listening for America. We're delighted to welcome you all here today. Bruce? Ken, thank you so much. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be with uh, everyone here uh, at, at WIDA. We've had some great conversations over the years uh, at WIDA events, and uh, this promises to be particularly interesting. As Ken said, uh, Kathy, you served as the senior official at USTR and State Department is now president of Listening for America. Uh, when she first came to me a uh, years, couple of years ago now and shared the idea for Listening for America, I was immediately taken with the idea. And I must admit, I thought, damn, why didn't I come up with this great up project? Uh, it's an effort that is long overdue. And I think we all will benefit from uh, her work and, and uh, this conversation. So without further ado, Kathy, why don't you uh, share with us some of your uh, takeaways? It would be good to unmute. Um, I just wanna thank um, Bruce, you, Peter, Kira, and all the folks who have supported this, this throughout the process. It, it, uh, we did, we went to 13 states, well over 37 cities, talked to over a thousand people um, over 2019 and 2020, mostly in person, but we got a little bit, um, uh, zoomed once we had to uh, do that for uh, COVID. Um, and there were regional differences, but there were some similarities. So I'm just going to go through some of those and then some of the recommendations that we came up with. Um, and I'll do it really briefly. 
First thing, which probably doesn't surprise anybody, is people did not list international trade as a top priority for the country when we asked them, what do you think are the top three things? But after we started talking to them more about you know, what they thought was important, et cetera, they basically were like, wait a minute, trade is touching everything in our, our daily life. And so I think it's a bit of, one of them referred to it as a hidden hero. Um, everybody offered the view without prompting that trade is complex. Um, and they were interested in understanding more and how do things actually work, which was really great. Um, people were also basically positive about uh, and saw advantages from globalization. Um, and this is counter to the, you know, inside the beltway um, sort of speak um, but, but we were surprised by that. Um, we heard a lot about strawberries in winter as a big advantage um, of globalization. Um, but, and probably not surprising, people were negative about trade agreements. Um, the narrative around trade agreements basically has devolved to trade agreements equals manufacturing jobs move abroad. Um, and that was really true. We, we did informal conversations and 50 focus groups, and it was really true in focus groups, uh, especially. And there were, um, there was basically among everybody we talked to, including people you would think would be a little more um, informed, um, they didn't really understand what was in trade agreements exactly. Um, but they did think that job skills retraining was a way to mit mitigate you know, the effects of job loss. Um, as probably not surprising, we encountered a lot of myths as we went along. One of them was people thought our overall trade with China was between 50 to 80% of our total trade imports exports. Um, they also didn't realize that over 90% of exporters were small businesses or that more than half of our imports were inputs. Um, and so, you know, we just gave some very basic facts about things and folks said that was super helpful. Um, we weren't trying to spin things. We were just sort of saying, here are the facts. Um, the other couple things are that small businesses that were in our trading are doing trade are doing it, but often don't know that there is a multilateral rules-based trading system in which they are operating. They're just doing their thing. Um, and people also, and I thought this was helpful to me, having been in this for 30 years or more, um, while they were negative about trade agreements, they were actually hopeful about the prospects for the future of trade. So they saw it as a way to connect people, raise up others outside the U.S. out of abject poverty, provide affordable access for U.S. citizens to goods and services, and even they saw it as a way to avoid global conflicts. Um, and we, we sort of got to that by all this series of pictures, which you'll see in our report. They have a huge wall to choose from, and these are the kinds of things that they chose. Um, they did also, no matter what party, uniformly express concerns about environmental degradation caused by trade and um, labor exploitation and inequality. Um, the other thing that we found um, as we went along and started looking at cities and talking to mayors and talking to economic planning people is that cities that had been crushed by foreign competition um, who had leadership and a plan had successfully turned the corner partly by leveraging their comparative advantages and having access to the global world. Um, and they also understood that to be able to do that, they needed support for imports and exports. Um, so just, you know, what that says to me, having been doing this for a long time, is that there are some failures of U.S. trade policy. Um, one is that we have not effectively communicated basic facts about trade to the general public. Uh, that, that is absolutely clear. Despite whatever we've all done, it hasn't really worked very well. The other thing that I think really needs to change is that as we were doing these trade agreements, we have not ever acknowledged that they could produce negative effects. We were always 
very rah-rah, here's all the benefits, but we never said, you know, there could be some negative effects on workers and specific sectors. And it also meant we didn't have a real specific plan for how to deal with those negative effects. And really what's happened is I think that because we haven't been upfront about that, about that there are downsides, there is now a loss of credibility um, and that we have to overcome. So here's a few recommendations and then I'm gonna stop the, um, so for the federal government, um, some things need to happen outside the beltway. First, uh, government officials need to do the kind of listening tours that we did. Senior officials, senior civil servants um, to go talk to people. There is no substitute for that. And the input that we get filtered um, here um, inside the beltway is, is just very different from what you see when you go out. Second, there needs to be a whole of government approach to trade. It, right now it's very much in silos, USTR does this, commerce does that. Um, but really, if we're gonna be effective, we have to break down these silos and look at how do we vertically involve cities, states, community colleges, tech schools, and USTR, the Small Business Administration, USDA, the Commerce Department, the Labor Department. This needs to be much more of a whole of government activity. Um, I think we also need to respond to struggling cities. Yes, struggling individuals, but also struggling cities and help them with economic planning that includes how do they plug into the global world. Um, and I think we need to help with more forward planning, recognizing that some industries are gonna be adversely affected by foreign competition going forward. And how do we help workers transition to something else? Um, we also recommend that they a trade core kind of like a, a Peace Corps of volunteers um, be established that can fan out and do some of this, that can help cities, that can look at small and medium-sized businesses and help them actually access their global opportunities. I can't emphasize enough the importance of community colleges in retooling and technical classes. But also, I think it would be super helpful to give classes and how do you import and export? Like, what is the mechanics of that? Because we found a lot of people running into those kind of issues. Also, as I just said, providing factual, non-politicized information um, to people in a way that is easy to understand is critical because we can't get good input if, they're, if they don't have the, the materials to build from. Um, I think it is very important that policymakers think about how do you build trade policy from the bottom up, not just from the top down. And after you listen to people and see what's really going on and think about things like small business access, what can be done to facilitate that, um, think about how to constitute advisory committees that include people like economic development officials, in addition to mayors from many medium sized cities and also think about more informal outreach, not just to the usual constituents that come in. Um, I would also say that um, this whole question of environmental degradation is something everybody raised. And so the question of how to use trade tools to deal with that, I think is, is great. And I think it can resonate with a lot of people. So bottom line, what I would say is, you know, we, Trade has been thought of as a political loser because the benefits are diffuse and the negative effects are tangible and specific. But what we found is that the public is actually open to seeing the positive aspects of living in a globalized world and to capitalizing on those aspects. Um, that's something that people are doing now. They're doing it with small and medium sized businesses. Um, but more has to be done to spread these effects to cities that have experienced large job loss due to foreign competition. And that includes helping cities retool. Um, we did not find anyone who longed for the past in those cities that have retooled. They were looking to the future and the opportunities that that could provide. And I think that's really one where we wanna get to as a country. Thanks. Thanks, Kathy. That was great. A uh, great overview. Uh, one follow-up question from me. Uh, in my years as a pollster, one of the things that was clear 
is that the greatest skepticism, concern, uh, animosity towards trade came from old white men like me. And so the question is, when you were doing these focus groups, were you able to discern a difference between younger participants and older participants, between men and women, maybe people of color and uh, white people? I mean, what, what any sense of that uh, in, in the conversation? Yeah, I would say, again, I didn't scientifically, you know, do it like you do in your polls, but definitely older people were more skeptical. I, I would say younger people um, tended to be, uh, were like, okay, competition, bring it on. Like we can do it. And um, I think the other thing that we found, which probably isn't surprising, is that in po places that had ports, cities that had ports, the general public sort of got trade a lot more. Um, part of the time we were um, talking to some of these cities was when we were just putting all the tariffs on uh, because of China. And there was a huge concern about that because people understood that trade was part of their livelihood of where they lived. Um, so yeah, I mean, there were some uh, older people who were super concerned, but I wouldn't say people were not at all concerned, um, but there was a less concern about competition from younger people. Thanks. Uh, let's turn to Peter now, if we can. Uh, Peter, um, you, know, you you have been in the forefront, uh, uh, as Kathy has been and, and Kira has been, but in the forefront of kind of the governmental, dare I say, bureaucratic, but also just, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, just you've been part of the bureaucracy and, you know, as a negotiator at the WTO, as a deputy USTR, as an uh, uh a career USTR uh, uh, official before that. Um, and my experience in watching you folks in action was, it's great to say you should go out and listen to the public, but exactly what hour of the day do you do that in? You know, I mean, you're basically overwhelmed by travel, by these negotiations. Um, and um, how, from your experience, could one integrate Kathy's recommendations into the day-to-day -day work of a trade negotiator who, who also, you know, has to get his or her portfolio accomplished? Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, thanks very much, Kathy. I mean, there is a, there's an awful lot of material in that to, uh, to discuss. Let me say along those lines, first, um, one thing that uh, your work brought more clearly to me is how much the formulation and the um, implementation of trade policy uh, is an inside the beltway operation. Um, and there obviously are a lot of reasons for that. I, I really realized that since we moved away from Washington. And uh, yeah, trade is not top of mind for people. People are worried about the, the things that they confront day to day. Now, that some of the things they're confronting are consequences of trade or even opportunities of trade, but they don't pull those two things together. Um, part of it is also that trade is very complex. And I have to say that my feeling is that the public media does a terrible job of reporting on trade. You know, it doesn't get a lot of I clicks, um, and so it, it isn't exciting generally. But when it is, it's negative, and that's what tends to get uh, reported. Um, so you know, one of the things is when you look at what is reported, it's very much the the catalog of myths that you identify and try to um, correct. Now, for Bruce, in terms of your question, and trade officials do try to correct those uh, myths. But frankly, when we would go out and speak, we would be talking to a very small slice of the American public. You know, you go and you talk to the Council on Foreign Relations in, in a city or something, or you're, you're talking at a conference where 
it's a bunch of either trade wonks or positive or negative trade ones. So, I mean, you're, one of the big advantages of your thing is that you got out and talked to the people who are just walking around the street minding their own business. Um, and you're right, Bruce, there is a very limited amount of time to do that, but it's also how do you connect with other than the usual suspects? Um, and I don't, have a, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I would like to see a lot more of education about trade. Yeah, the community colleges would be one place. I mean, it's not just about trade for them, but it's, as you were saying, Kathy, how do they, how do they operate within the trade world and benefit from it? Whether it's just the kinds of jobs they get in the United States, um, or is it that they themselves take advantage of, um, of uh, uh, the internet and, uh, and uh, express delivery to start their own little business that they can do. Um, but I really think that there's a huge gap of education and I think it needs to start in high school that kids in high school don't learn anything about the economy. Um, and um, unless they understand the economy and trade is part of it, they're gonna have a difficult time being successful in the world that they're entering. Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, Kira, uh, you were engaged in much of your USGR career in a very technical area. <laughs> I dare say that, and I don't know whether Kathy did this, but uh, Kathy and you did this, but um, if you use the two words intellectual property to average people, their eyes would glaze over. They would have no idea what you're talking about or let alone care or understand the importance of it. Um, and yet, you know, that increasingly is a very important part of our commercial relationship with the rest of the world. Uh, it's the driver of future service industries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, um, in, in your experience, how do we talk to and talk with the American public about uh, intellectual property in particular, but even more broadly services, which I think, you know, people kind of get for whatever reason, manufacturing, but they don't get services. And of course, that's a, such a huge part of our trading relationship with the rest of the world and will be a growing part of our trading relationship with the rest of the world. So first of all, let me take a step back and thank Ken and you for hosting us. And also, obviously, this is me speaking as myself, not on behalf of Viacom CBS. And this really, a lot of my comments are based on my former career and also my time uh, working with Kathy as her second chair, or as, I, as I refer to it as her second banana on this uh, in this process. Um, Getting to this issue of IP and complex issues, the interesting thing, Bruce, because we were going around and it was 2018 through 2020 in the midst of all the recent trade wars, and actually people did get IP and people, we got a lot of parody. And I was most shocked by, you know, farmers out in Iowa were like, oh, it's, so, you know, yeah, these, these tariffs are hitting us, but it's important because we have to protect our intellectual property against China. So that concept had gotten out there that, that, the intellectual property was something important and something that we had that was an advantage and something that we had to protect. So I think we're ahead on that. I think where we're farther behind is the other point that you made as services, because as Kathy mentioned in our discussions, we would explain to folks that we are, you know, maybe manufacturing had gone down, but we were a net exporter of services. Um, and that we had a trade surplus in services. And that's the one, that's the area where people have a real hard time getting their heads around. You know, and the other problem is when you, when you hear service economy in the media, you know, that usually means flipping burgers and service economy jobs are seen as sort of the lower, the lower end jobs. And so I think we do on the services side is where, where we have to do that better job. And again, it goes back to what, what Peter was saying. And it goes back to this idea that Kathy 
has of sort of this trade core is we really do need to up our economic and trade literacy. And part of that is explain to people what we do because we were in Miami and people didn't understand that we were net exporters of, of service of tourism services and financial services because that meant that the tourists came to, to Miami or to Florida and they came and they used the banks in Miami. So that was a concept, that is a harder concept to get across actually than intellectual property, I, I will say. Can I just add um, to on that? One of my, you know, the most interesting things to me was meeting with this um, startup entrepreneur in Ann Arbor who had, uh, was proudly talking about, he was doing Salesforce for small business. And he, um, so I, and he's like, we're in 26 countries, you know? And so he's like doing international trade. And I said, so, well, what do you think about, you know, trade agreements? And he goes, well, that has nothing to do with me. I'm a service. So I just am saying the Peter is so right about the gap. The other thing that we saw a lot is we would ask people like, you know, have you were, they would talk about kind of a comparative advantage when they would talk about strawberries in winter or, you know, various things that other countries could do well and send to us, or we could do to send to them. And we're like, oh, have you ever heard of this concept, comparative advantage? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thing, oh, sorry, Kathy. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Jump in, Peter. Uh, on services. Yeah, that is really, A, it's the sleeping giant of, uh, of trade, but it is, yeah, it is very misunderstood or completely not understood because people, to the degree they recognize it, they think only of a very direct service that is being provided. I mean, maybe a, you know, a, a diagnostic service that is done over the internet. But just I'll make two quick points. Number one, the way in which we report trade understates services. And that was that is shown dramatically in a study that the WTO and the OECD did a number of years ago, where they looked at trade flows and tried to break out services from manufacturing. And the way they did it was through input output analysis. So they looked at an airplane. And when an airplane is sold, let's say by Airbus to the United States, the entire value of that airplane is called a manufactured good. But a huge part of the production or of the providing of that airplane are services. So when the WTO and the OECD looked at it, what they said was the way we report trade, 24, 25% of world trade services. But when you break out the services components of so-called manufacturers, it's about 48% of trade is services. So, you know, that, I mean, that's a pretty sophisticated nuance to make, but it is a, it is a very important one because we're providing, as Kira said, we've had surpluses in services since the 1970s um, and it has continued to grow. Um, let me let me jump in here to yeah, go down go this the services rabbit hole just a little bit uh, to push you a little bit, Kathy. Maybe you can start, but but the others jump in. Um, implicit in what we're saying here, all of us are saying, is that well, yeah, manufacturers are dying, but we're a great service provider. Implicitly, and we will continue to be the world services provider. So everything's okay, Dory, in the United States. I think history would suggest to us that the competition in the provision of services will only grow over time, the international competition. So what do we do now to prepare people for the fact that, yeah, maybe we get upset about call centers in India today, and maybe some people know that their x-rays are red in India sometimes, but over time, more and more of these services can be provided by other people as effectively and efficiently and cheaper than we can provide them. And what do, we, what do we do about that in terms of communication with the public? Well, can I thank you for that, Bruce? And I just wanna take one step back on manufacturing because you know there is this 
thing that is saying, oh, the reason why we've lost manufacturing, the sole reason is because um, of trade agreements and they've caused all this manufacturing to go overseas. But the um, St. Louis Fed did a wonderful graph of manufacturing jobs in the US and uh, it started right after World War II and it goes like this. <laughs> I mean, and, and we didn't start really in, in picking up on trade until the jobs were already down here. So this is not because of trade. <laughs> Certainly there is some aspect of that and that should be dealt with, but I think we've allowed that myth to persist. And it, what I think is that it goes to the same question you're asking about services. And that is, we are going to be affected by um, international competition. And I think we need to be more planful about it. Instead of just stepping back and saying, let the chips fall where they do, market economy, you know, labor is some perfect adjustment and people will find other jobs because it doesn't work that way in the short term for people. Um, it may work that way statistically. And I will tell you, I had a wonderful conversation with the Swedish um, economy minister. And I was asking them, why are Swedes so supportive of trade? Like what makes them so supportive? And he said, because we try to look ahead, we looked ahead and saw our shipbuilding industry and our textiles industry was going to just go away. That we, we were not going to be able to compete. And so we said, okay, this is going to happen. We need a whole of government approach to think about how we are going to prepare our society for doing other things. And that's what they did. And they said that th this person at least said he felt that people felt like, okay, if competition comes, there's a plan and we're not going to be crushed by it. We're going to move on to other things. And I think that we really need to do that. And I think we need to be honest about it instead of trying to say, oh, everything's great. Nothing to see here. Just sweep all this under the rug or, you know, we're going to defend everything because the truth is change is going to happen and we have to be prepared for it. And, and just to jump in on that, I mean, I think one of the cities that we were most impressed about was Greenville, South Carolina, right? The capital of the textile industry. Um, and just the fact that they, the city leaders there, and this is where Kathy keeps on talking about sort of city leaders and visionaries, they knew the textile eventually, the textile uh, factories were eventually gonna move. And so they started before that trying to attract other manufacturing because they realized sort of what is our comparative advantages well, we have a high skilled workforce that knows how to do manufacturing. So they started attracting, you know, um, other companies to come in and other companies from overseas and other industries. And so I think that that's the kind of vision that you have to have. And yeah, no, they went through a horrible patch when all the textile companies up and left and went to, you know, and all the factories closed, but they're a bustling, booming center of automotive R&D and automotive manufacturing. And, you know, one of the things I love, the anecdote that I love was that the week that we were there in Greenville, a Chinese factory was opening up, it was a, Chi it was a factory for Chinese textile manufacturer. And it was because they produce very um, um, a high tech uh, fabric that goes into car seats. And the manufacturer was in, you know, in the Greenville area. And so they needed to be near the factory. But I just thought how full circle it had come that there was a, a textile factory opening, but it was a Chinese one. But, but it, was just, it was just this thought that they, the city leaders knew that there was going to be change coming. And so they thought about it and they planned for it. They worked with the state um, government to sort of, you know, beef up their community college and their technical college um, system so that they could have that technical training to help the workers readjust to the new jobs. So, I mean, that's, I think, what's important is to have that vision and not just wait for it to happen. Did you find, though, Kathy and, and Kira, I mean, I, I remember a story I wrote for the National Journal years ago where I went to two small Missouri towns that had lost their shoe manufacturing business to imports. One town was rebounding and the other wasn't. And the only conclusion I could draw was 
the young one town that was rebounding had a young leadership who saw who wanted a future for their children in that town and the other town that wasn't rebounding had an older leadership and their kids had moved away and they were just kind of marking time i mean to what extent is some of this dependent upon who happens to be in the leadership roles in these little towns I think that vision is is absolutely key. Individuals matter, there's no doubt about it. And I just to add on to what Greenville did, they like marketed their um their community colleges and they said to these manufacturers, we will train workers to do what you need. But they were so smart. They didn't just look at this one little thing. They said, okay, and we're going to get our universities to start doing applied research that can be relevant to these automakers. So you can kind of mesh that together. And we need a livable city. So we're going to build bike paths and we're going to repurpose these old factories into mixed use development and et cetera, et cetera. So they were kind of looking at the whole vertical stack of what may makes things good. Um, and I think that that is about vision. I, uh, there is no doubt about it. And so what does that then mean? Well, not everybody has it, but I think that is also where maybe the federal government can be helpful. I mean, if there is some sort of a trade core or some sort of a revitalization core that can help like maybe get people on their feet a little bit. Yeah, I think the most one of the most interesting and exciting parts of the work uh, that uh, Kathy and Kira did was this digging down at some of the success stories of um, medium size or small size cities. Um, and yeah, Bruce, your question is the relevant one. How do you how do you replicate that? Um, and one of the things I was wondering about is. You know, we have all of these reports when there is a trade agreement signed. Um, and it, it's the reports don't really talk a lot about the problems. Um, they're, you know, they use general marketing uh, or general market uh, analysis to talk about what the impacts will be with a bunch of statistics. But is it feasible to have more of the uh, mitigation strategies. I mean, if we see in, in a certain agreement, certain sectors that are likely to be hit hard, all right, don't just sort of say, well, that's X percent and that X percent is less than the Y percent of benefits. Say, okay, what sorts of steps need to be taken? Now, the question there is, who is in a good position to do that? And I, I think we have to be a little bit careful that we don't want just some new Washington task force to be telling um, a medium-sized town, telling Brockton, Massachusetts, what it needs to be doing. So for me, the still unanswered question is, who is in a position, how do we organize people who have the knowledge to be helpful to these communities to implement mitigation strategies? Peter, I think that's where Kathy's whole of government approach comes from, because I think there are um, agencies out there like the Department of Commerce that are out there to help those local um, communities. And it's just but they never get they, they're never brought in at the right time. So I think that that's part of it. And I think a mitigation strategy as part of an ITC report is is great. I mean, when when. Um, there are federal projects and they have to do an environmental review. One of the key things is sort of how, how are you going to mitigate this environmental damage? I think there's a, there has to be these mitigation um, thought, you, thinking about sort of these mitigation measures as part of these reports. And that's, I guess, maybe when you bring in all those other agencies, that alphabet soup of agencies that we know are out there that, you know, that folks at USTR we never think about because that's, oh, that's all domestic. We don't know anything about that. And, and just to go back, and I'm sorry, Bruce, because I'm jumping around, but just going back to your, your first question, you know, I was a, I was a, you know, I was a, a frontline trade negotiator, but I was all about like, oh, I want to be all about the international side of things. Oh, you know, and I knew more cities outside the U.S. than I did inside the U.S. And that was a great thing about this project is I really got to know the U.S. And 
I really do think it is important that the frontline negotiators, and again, there's, you know, maybe there's not enough hours in the day, but we really have to sort of bring in the, you're here not because you're an internationalist, but you really have to understand the U.S. part of things and how your work fits into the U.S. Because I think that's the part that's missing at the front lines. And so I don't know if that means, you know, when there is travel domestically that, you know, that insisting that our frontline, you know, negotiators travel dom more domestically and see these towns and see these cities, or that, you know, it's a requirement before you even come into the door that you have that, um, I, you know, I don't know, I, I, I posit that as well. But I think that is a really important um, factor here, is really having to understand the U.S. side of things. Yeah. And can I just add to that, like, Bruce, I think your question is well taken. Everybody's super busy. I think it's also a matter of priority. You know, if, if part of your priority is, hey, we need to make sure that we're connecting to the public, you know, the walking around public, as Peter calls them, uh, to me, you know, you're not going to be able to move forward with a trade agenda if you don't have public support. And you're not going to build it by being on high and disconnected from people. Um, at the same time, people actually, you know, when we talk to people, they're like, well, who's ever going to listen to me? That's a sad statement. People should feel like their opinion does matter. And to Peter's point, I think, you know, the federal government can't come in and terraform cities. That, that is a terrible idea. But they can certainly help and give some tools to cities to figure things out what works in their context. Um, so anyway. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, it is interesting in this whole discussion about listening more to Americans. It struck me that in theory, at least, our form of government says that's what Congress is supposed to do. And we are implicitly saying that Congress really doesn't do enough of that, right? They reflect some special interests, but not necessarily the average interest of the, some of their constituents, in part because, you know, that's not where their electoral support comes from or their money comes from, or I don't know what. But I do think that you're right. I mean, not just USTR, but the State Department and others. I mean, this whole middle uh, foreign policy for the middle class is in part, we have to listen more to the American people about what they mean or support for international engagement on a range of issues around the world. But let's, let's throw this open to uh, questions from the audience. Ken, I think you have some questions from the audience. We, we do indeed. Uh, thank you for the great conversation. Wanna, um, can try to, as we usually do, pull a few of the questions together uh, if we can. Um, we've gotten several from some current sitting U.S. government officials at both the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and the Commerce Department, uh, among others. Um, what I'm hearing, and this goes to a little bit of your conversation, Kathy, about a whole of government approach, you know, I think three of you, but I don't think Bruce did, served in government. Um, in various roles at US trade at USTR and at the State Department. Um, you know, is it is the US government constituted to do this kind of cross-functional work that you're talking about? Is it just too big to do some of that work that's needed to coordinate these different functions? Bringing in one of the questions from, from someone at USTR, you know, uh, uh, is there a way to connect trade policy and the actual international trade that's happening? with the training of workers so that, for example, the, that while the, that they were happening in tandem. So for example, and this isn't in the question, when we were negotiating the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, uh, in the last decade, were we doing things as a, a country to align our ec economic goals and for workers with what we were trying to negotiate for the TPP? Presumably that would have meant investing in the ports on the West Coast, for example. Were, are we doing those things? Are we looking ahead at to what our policy is on trade and then aligning our worker, our worker centric trade policies, worker centered trade policies to those goals. And, you know, I'll just, I mentioned this in our pre chat. I was on the Hill in the early 90s and there was a bill called S4 that was a competitiveness bill. It never went anywhere. We still passed the NAFTA, but we didn't pass the competitiveness bill. We've got trade and infrastructure and trade and, uh, and we have uh, physical infrastructure bills and human infrastructure bills sitting at, 
I mean, is that what we really need to be doing is getting our own house in order so that we're able to actually better engage the global economy? Sorry, big question for all of you, I guess. Well, one thing I would say, Ken, that that is such a, it's a question and an answer in the question, right? And, you know, the question is the US government constituted to do cross-functional things we do cross-functional things all the time. Trade negotiations are cross-functional. And so people are looking at, you know, every sort of who have agencies who have piece of the elephant are all saying, okay, what do we want to put in this agreement? So we know how to do cross-functional things. What I would say is that in my personal experience, and, and Peter and Kira may have different experiences, but my personal experience, we were very myopic. Like we were looking at what's the provisions of this agreement and you know what's the input of these agencies instead of looking more expansively as Peter was saying about, okay, what's gonna be the effects of these, either positive or, you know, or negative, and how do we think about the fact that this is going to happen and how are we positioned to take advantage of it and mitigate the downside. And we don't, we have not in the past at least done that piece. And to me, that's, that's very much the, the missing piece that needs to happen. Yeah, just following up on that for a minute. I mean, um, I agree with all of that, but also I am, again, really struck by local people who take up the, the mandate, who see what's going to happen, and they start making adjustments locally. So one thing, and, and the trade representative people are great. We're great. But we, as Kathy said earlier, we're operating on a trade agreement. We're not experts in how communities can adjust. So one of the things I think can be done better is to get the word out to communities, to the academic world about this is how we see the world changing or the US changing as a result of what we're doing. Take that into account in your planning. So for example, just occurred to me, city planning schools, they don't, I think, have a clue about what's happening in trade yet in terms of planning for their cities and public administration and so and their programs, they need to know that and understand, or at least think about, well, what does that mean in terms of what we would do as far as city planning? And you can, you know, you can stretch that out to education, you can stretch that certainly to community colleges. Um, so somehow we've got to do a much better job of communicating what some of the opportunities consequences, implications are of the kinds of trade policies that we're pursuing. If I might jump in, there was an interesting comment in the Q&A about how cities are trying to plan for climate mitigation that I think is somewhat anticipatory of what some federal government might be doing, which the government hasn't launched these new policies yet, but they're discussing them and cities are getting ahead of those. So I guess we are you know, seeing that maybe more on the climate front than we see it on the trade front, um, which is, is interesting. Um, we also have a, a great note um, came in um, from uh, one of our friends at USTR mentioning a uh, recent US EU trade and technology ministerial took place in Pittsburgh. Um, and a really great example of a city that's transitioned to the new economy. And uh, they heard from a lot of local organizations, including educational institutions, and local worker development organizations on their work there. So really seems like the, a lot of this grassroots things are happening. Is that a disconnect as well for policymakers? I mean, clearly USTR was part of that, so that's great. But are our politicians in Washington, the ones who vote on these things, are they all, is all these things connected for them? Are, we, are they getting uh, the word? And it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is really grassroots stuff, not grass tops, not coming from Washington, but coming from the bottom up. Well, I mean, I would, you know, and I, and I hate to keep harping on South Carolina, but it was, it's such a great example. I think South Carolina, it was, it was grass tops as well. I mean, I really think, and, you know, I, I really wish for Tollings was around because I'd love to sit down with him and say, what were you thinking? Because he really, it, it was obvious that he knew it was going to be happening and he obviously railed against it, but he, I think he helped set up the state, you know, he made sure certain federal money got 
you know, went to South Carolina and then you worked with this, you know, the state government to, to sort of set up these, these policies, you know? And so I think, I think, I think that's the perfect example. You want somebody in Congress who is listening to the people who understands what's coming up, who can then sit down and say, okay, this train's hitting us. What do we need to have in place at the state and local level to help us get through that? Um, and I think that's how you have to do it. And I, I imagine that's what's happening on the climate side. You know, those far reaching states that are thinking about that, that are seeing that train coming down the line are working on that. And I think we just don't do enough. And I think this goes back to Kathy's very first statement. Nobody thinks about trade, you know, and not, nobody thinks trade in, impacts them until it does, right? And so nobody really has a deep think on trade at that, you know, to that extent. So Kira, following up on that, and you mentioned Senator Hollings, um, you know, South Carolina has, I, I think, a big BMW plant. You know, do people understand, I, I hate to sound like we're talking down from Washington, but do people connect uh, FDI, foreign direct investment in their communities is the other is an, as, as part of the trade equation as well, and that they're investing in their jobs, or do they see that as somehow a give a giveaway of American sovereignty or something? And what is no? I would just say, if I could jump in here, you know, I think people cities want FDI, and I don't, I don't, I did not detect anybody who thought FDI was a giving away of sovereignty. I think folks looked at they they sort of basically they looked more expansively. They didn't just look inside the US and they said, what are we good at? What's our comparative advantage? And where should we go <laughs> to get companies to come here who can build on that? And Grand Rapids, Michigan did the exact same thing. And they decided they want to do, um, they were gonna spend a lot of money and invest in medical stuff. So they got a lot of medical companies to come. And there was a history in, in Western Michigan of pharmaceuticals, Upjohn and others. So, so they kind of built on what they had, um, but expanded their scope of inquiry beyond the US, I would say. And I would say also one connection that people at BMW made um, was they understood, okay, the largest plant that BMW owns is in South Carolina. That is their largest manufacturing plant. And when the tariffs were announced, they were super worried because they're like, well, wait a minute, we need some of those imports to make these cars. We, you know, we're, we're bringing in some parts from Germany. So they understood the connection. I think a lot of people do not understand the connection between foreign direct investment and imports, imports in particular. So, so following up, and it ties in a couple other questions. We've had some supply chain questions come in. Um, certainly COVID has impacted supply chains. We're hearing about a lot of problems at ports right now. Um, are people understanding that impact on their daily lives? Are they, is that something that's resonating right now currently that you're hearing from the people you talk to? I mean, I know you're hearing about this, the, car, the automobile supply chain shortage is, is acute right now. Uh, used car prices are through the roof compared to where they were a few years ago. Um, new cars are not available on the lots. Are, are people understanding that, 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 that the global supply chains are something that impacts their daily lives? And a related question, two part, is about the China tariffs. They seem to now be embedded. They don't seem to be being negotiated away at the moment. Uh, have people just accepted that, do they, under, do they accept and understand that they're paying those tariffs through the cost, the, ex, the increased cost they may be paying, that it gets passed on to them. It's not something that the importers are necessarily paying. So just, you know, we, we didn't do interviews in this this past year, um, but COVID was going on when we were, we were doing some of the Zoom things. And it was interesting that while people understood that there were shortages, we did not hear from people, well, because of that, we need to like do everything in the US. That was not people's reaction to that part. Um, we did hear when the China tariffs got put on a lot of concern and not just in port cities about what that was going to mean. Um, you know, we met this, this woman who um, had a small business selling tea and she was like, how am I going to be able to do, I can't, tea is on the list. I'm like, I'm out of business. And 
you know, so, and, and, you know, I met in, uh, in Michigan, a uh, Western Michigan, a uh, manufacturer of industrial saws, like, like bigger than your room. And they, of course, made this stuff out of specialty steel. And when the steel tariffs were put on, their specialty steel was on there. And they said, no one in the U.S. makes this steel. We're going to be out of, you know, we're going to have to pay these huge tariffs. Meanwhile, our competitors in Europe are not paying them and we're going to go out of business. And so I think a lot of small businesses did understand and individuals did understand across the board that tariffs got passed through to them. That was actually kind of interesting. Well, ask the lobstermen of New England if they know about the tariffs that China has put on U.S. lobster as they see their Canadian competitors shipping lobster out to China. If I could, if, if I could jump in, yeah, with because uh, we're nearing the witching hour, I think. Uh, uh, I have a, a final question, I think, for Kathy. Kathy, you called your project Listening for America not listening to America. That cannot be an accident. So I'd be curious if you would explain to everybody why you use the word for and not to. You are correct. And just one little note before you jump in, Kathy. Um, we, we're gonna post the, the copy of the report in the chat for everybody. And before we close this session out, um, please uh, link to that. It'll open in your browser separately. You can keep reading it after we're finished up with that. Sorry, Kathy, sorry for interrupting. I just want to give folks a couple seconds before you, as you close up, uh, to be able to click on that link. So you're right. It was not an accident, Bruce. And so um, I felt like I was listening for what America is. What do they think? Not just listening to them, but like, what is America about on these issues? And also on behalf of America, listening. So that's why it's for and not to. Well, I think that that uh, everyone should read this report. I think it is uh, a a testament to the value of listening rather than just talking at people. And it also is a sign that we have a lot to do in helping our fellow Americans, and including ourselves, but certainly our fellow Americans, to adjust to the accelerating pace of change in this global world. Um, I think that uh, you know one of the festering problems we have is that we who have benefited so greatly in our careers from adapting so well to this change have not appreciated how hard it has been for many people to adjust to this change. And that uh, any attitudes we had in the past about, well, they just have to get over it and get on with it and you know they have to change, they vote. <laughs> and we ex have experienced the consequences of that vote. So I think that we need to help people deal with the accelerating pace of change. Because the one thing we know from our lifespan is that the pace of change is only going to accelerate in, in, in this global environment we now live in. And, and we have to be better prepared for it and be able, better able to, to deal with it. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for participating. It's been a great conversation. And again, uh, to uh, commend you for such a wonderful project. I just think it's such a great idea. And we'll, we'll see everybody again at, a, at another WIDA event. Take thank care. You. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Kira, Peter, Kathy. Uh, delighted to have had you on the WIDA webinar platform. Um, look forward to having all of you back again. Everyone, please take care of yourself. Take care of everyone around you. And please, if you're able to and able to access the vaccine, please get it. it it's in, for you and for everyone around you. Thanks.